Good afternoon, everyone. If you are just joining us, we're just going to take a couple of minutes here to let our guests continue to get uh, admitted to the Zoom room. Thank you so much. And again, good afternoon, everyone. We're just letting some others just still file in. Thank you all for joining us today. On a pretty summer day. <clears throat> okay. So we may still be admitting a few people in here or there, but we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you everyone for joining us today. This is our Summer Landmarks Illinois Snapshots presentation, Investing in Historic Places. I want to thank our dedicated and generous members and supporters for joining us today. I am Lisa DiChiera, Director of Advocacy for Landmarks Illinois. And this session today that we are presenting to you is supported as always by our annual corporate sponsors shown on the screen shortly here, who we are happy to uh, acknowledge. Suzanne, can you advance to the next screen? I'm trying to, Lisa. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> There we go. So we always want to acknowledge uh, our generous corporate supporters. You can see the names here on the screen. Uh, if you know anyone from these companies, these firms, please always take the time to thank them. They are wonderful supporters of Landmarks Illinois work and uh, they make programs like this possible. If you are not currently a member of Landmarks Illinois, we ask that you join us. You can join us through our website, www.landmarks.org. And we hope that you will consider joining today if you are not currently a member. For those of you not familiar with Landmarks Illinois, we are a nonprofit, non-governmental membership-based organization empowering people to save special places throughout the state. Landmarks Illinois is excited to welcome members, supporters, and friends to its annual Richard H. Driehaus Foundation Preservation Awards. If you'll pencil it in your calendar, our next award event is Friday, October 23rd. This is one of our uh, most well attended and favorite events of many because it's all about feel good stories. Uh, it's an event that really showcases the best preservation projects throughout the state, people doing incredible work to save places that matter to their communities. And we hope that you will join us and really be inspired. Look for more information about the event on our website as well. After this event today, Preservation Snapshots will take a summer hiatus, but you can join us in the fall. 
on Thursday, September 30th for our next preservation, uh, preservation presentation, it will be about Landmarks Illinois next 50 years. Some of you may be aware that this year is our 50th anniversary. We were founded in 1971. We are evolving and creating a model preservation organization that is inclusive, diverse, equitable, and will be relevant for another 50 years. Join us to learn about our newly created guiding principles that will serve as our code of conduct and catalyst to fight for justice, combat climate change, and shift who decides what is significant. Hear from our president and CEO, Bonnie McDonald, on how the guiding principles will be put into practice and our goal of elevating these new ideas about preservation statewide will proceed. Please join the discussion at this lecture on shaping preservation for the future and what our future 50 years will look like. So now to today's talk, investing in historic places. For those of you that may not be aware, we have a very uh, special program that we are so proud of because it empowers small nonprofit organizations through grants to continue to renovate special places to get the assistance that they need and basically gives organizations the opportunity to, uh, to and take the money that we give them through grants to basically do further fundraising as well. Um, we have three grant programs. In April of 2020, two of our grant programs, our Heritage Fund and our Donnelly Fund, uh, were in the last round for the fiscal year. And as the pandemic was upon us, we had $26,000 to give, and we decided to shift the giving to go toward pandemic relief. As all of you know, by spring of last year, so many small organizations were financially suffering, and we really felt it important to provide grants that would not only be available to still do bricks and mortar work or to be able to use for important consultant type services, but also just for operating costs and for the needs of an organization to stay afloat during that really difficult time. So with that, we put out the call and asked for people to apply to us by May 15th of last year for grants that we decided we would give in the amount of $2,000. This is not a large amount of money we are aware, but it was what we were able to provide out of a $26,000 pot we felt most fairly. And so we wanted to select 13 organizations to award. Today, you are going to hear from four of those organizations. We received 95 applications for these small throughout the state and the Chicagoland area. So it was extremely difficult to select 13 out of the 95. We wanted to select those organizations that had budgets less than a million dollars and had less than seven full-time staff and had missions that we felt were important and aligned with our own while still functioning within his So today, what you're going to hear is how those four organizations and their leaders pivoted during this really difficult time last spring. So today you're going to hear from, in Chicago, Pastor Phil Jackson, who is the founder and the CEO of the Firehouse Community Arts Center in the neighborhood of North Lawndale. Also, Martin Sorge, from ex who's the executive director of Uptown United in Chicago's Uptown neighborhood. Kurt Bogalka, who is the administrator of the McHenry County Historical Society in Union in McHenry County. And Betty Richards, who is a board member of Save the Lorraine Foundation in Hoopston. 
And for those of you who don't know where the town of Hoopston is located, <laughs> it is in southeastern Illinois, not that far from Champaign, just northwest or northeast of Champaign and north of Danville. And we did a little bit of research yesterday just to give you some context of the type of communities that we work with all around the state. Hoopston has a population of 5,300 people. Compare that to North Lawndale, which has a population of 35,932 people, according to the 2019 census. And in Uptown, a population of 58,000 people. Now, we may have thought Hoopston was the smallest community represented here with 5,300 people, although actually Kurt gets the prize because Union has 580 people <laughs> in its community, <laughs> even though McHenry County, of course, is a larger place with a population of over 307,000, but Union itself is quite small. So with that, we're going to hear from each of our grant recipients for just a few minutes each. And then we're going to have a panel discussion at which time we welcome our guests to submit questions in the chat room and we will try to address all of your questions. So with that, Pastor Phil Jackson, if you would um, unmute yourself and uh, give us a little bit of background on your wonderful organization and its impact in North Lawndale and the efforts that you all had to go through at the beginning months of the pandemic. Go ahead and unmute, hold on Pastor Phil. Happens to you, <laughs> we'll wait for you, we'll wait for you. Go ahead and try it again. You may just wanna hover your, um, there okay. you go, you got it. The host had me on a mute. Uh, prison. So I just, oh, no. um, so, um, so just a little bit about what we are doing, right? Or what our work is. Is that what you're, you're asking? Yes, please. As I was trying to unmute, I try to get focused on that. So our work at the firehouse is to interrupt the cycle of violence in the life of youth and young adults, the power of the arts, right? And our work is, uh, uh kind of threefold, uh, 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 aspect, especially around COVID is that we need to continue to fight for folks who are trying to um, create havoc in the neighborhood with violence because of different opposition. We need to find a way that those who are trying to live and find a way to feed their families when they're losing hours from jobs or people are getting sick, how can we support them and how we can continue to create a workforce development for uh, the young men who are trying to move on with their life. And so our work, um, and then we have some prevention arm where young people who are involved and in, they're exposed to violence, but not perpetrators of it are able to engage as well. And so as young people are involved, uh, uh, especially with the COVID challenge, uh, it was like more shootings were happening, even though everyone's supposed to be in shelter in place. Um, so how do we keep our staff safe as well as engage them to continue to hit the neighborhood where all these shootings are happening? And so that was a challenge that we, that we, we took on. While at the same time, we're recognizing in a lot of families that are moving in with each other because someone lost an apartment. And so now, because of work, and so now this went from eight people to now 15 people in that home. So we then were able to uh, prepare fully cooked lunches and fully cooked um, dinners for families, over 250, 300 families a week for, uh, till now, <laughs> we're still doing that. And, and folks were able to get uh, lunches uh, and, and dinners on Tuesday for three days and then on Thursday for another three days. And some of the young men who are in the street who family need those resources and even their own children, we were able to get them off the street a little bit more from trying to sell drugs or do whatever because their family had the food for them to be able to eat. So all these particular nuances um, kind of dominoed into one another with the support um, of Landmark. And uh, one aspect of support led to another and then pretty soon we got food donated and then we got food at a less expensive cost and it just began to to really uh, impact um, our journey in the life of young people and we were able to uh, see um, in certain areas where we were focused on some of the violence decreasing because of the support that um, was met through food distribution and just quickly pastor phil 
so everyone is aware, we're looking at a historic firehouse here. This is your home. If you yes. could tell everyone the location of it and when your organization acquired it. So we own a 10,000 square foot, 100 year old or more than 100 year old Chicago fire station, basement, first floor and a second floor. And we acquired it December 18th, 2007. I remember it was a cold day. We cut the lock and we came right in to start gutting the place out um, and converting it to an art center for actual programming was the summer of 08 is when we had our first art program. And the building wasn't done, but each year we kept adding more and more to the finished construction. And uh, tell us the location. Mm. 2111 South Hamlin, North Lawndale on the west side of Chicago. Thank you, and it, it's a beautiful building, and uh, and we'll and we'll get to that more uh, when we come back to you and how this place has really served the community, which is just so incredible. Thank you, Pastor Phil. Thank you. Martin, can you give us a summary of Uptown United's uh, pivot during the pandemic last spring, and then you have a new home to tell us about. Do we have Martin on the phone with us? Hey, can you hear me there, Lisa? There you are, yes. Good afternoon, everyone, um, and thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Martin Sorge. I'm the Executive Director of Uptown United and the Uptown Chamber of Commerce. Um, we're the neighborhood economic and community development organizations that serves the Uptown neighborhood on the north side of Chicago. Um, so there's a couple of things that, that Martin, we're, Martin, just so you know, we're just we're getting some feedback. Martin, we're getting some feedback. Uh, we're, we're not able to hear you. Martin, and maybe you walked somewhere that's not. That any Try again. Go ahead. Is that any better? Yes. Great. OK, let me know if, if you have problems hearing me. Um, so uh, we purchased the building at uh, 4619 North Broadway about 20 years ago, had been renting out the space um, actually to an architecture firm, um, which is in the Uptown Square Landmark District. And we needed to look for a new office. So we decided to move into the building that we've owned for a while, um, but it needed significant renovations to be able to make it our home. Um, and so as part of that, we, did, we renovated the storefront, um, built out an open concept office for our small team, um, and really excited to be moving to a ground floor location right in the heart of Uptown. So um, this grant really helped us be able to make the uh, office renovation happen. Um, and we are, we're really excited we got to sort of uncover a few landmark features of the building that were hidden for many decades. Um, the other big piece of our work is we mainly work to support our local businesses and organizations in the uptown area. And when the pandemic hit, we really had to spring into action to support our businesses. We really, uh, one thing my, my team says is we kind of shifted to really being small business social workers. So really checking in with our businesses, letting them know what's been, what rules were changing, what was closing, unfortunately, and then really making sure we called everybody to make sure they were taking advantage of all of the pandemic relief programs. Um, so that's really where we spent most of the past year was making sure our businesses stayed afloat, knew what was going on, we also really expanded outdoor dining opportunities in Uptown for all of our businesses, many of whom never had or really were interested in having a sidewalk cafe. One piece of that that we did was on the 4800 block of North Broadway. Many folks will know that's where the Green Mill is. Um, we worked with um, several Chicago departments to transform the parking lane on that block to spaces for dining and for folks to um, enjoy 
cocktails at the Green Mill, which um, bars and taverns aren't allowed to have outdoor cafe space, but with this program, they were allowed to have some space. So we really helped enliven that little corner of Uptown. Um, and yeah. Thank you, Martin. And uh, obviously, uh, Kurt, you, you know, McHenry County Historical Society is just a completely different type of community. Uh, go ahead to the next slide, Suzanne. Yeah, so you want me to, um, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, so yeah, we're, we're a little different animal. Um, we've been around since we actually outdistanced you. We were formed in 1963 um, in, the, in the county seat of Woodstock. And in 1976, uh, Bicentennial, we opened up our museum here in Union. And it was a uh, former Union High School turned middle school. It dates, the building dates to uh, 1870 and it's made of limestone. And we own actually two of the three limestone structures still left in McHenry County. The other being Pringle School, which is a one room 1867 school. It's located um, just kind of north of Marengo. Um, and uh, we did a test by the way, and, and both stones were quarried in uh, Garden Prairie, which is just across the Boone County line. So they came from the same place. Um, so we have, a, we have a lot of structures. Um, we have a 1843 log cabin on the museum grounds, an 1895 one room school that was moved here. Uh, we also own a church that was built in 1898, the Riley Methodist Church. And um, we have an 1885 town hall. So some might say we own too many buildings, but um, we've, we've kept them safe, which was the intent. So, and, um, and Landmarks has been helpful in that process. Um, so as, as far as the, you know, no one saw the pandemic coming, right? I mean, it's funny when you go back and look at the old, um, you know, if you go back to like early March and what was going on, we were kind of living our lives oblivious to what, to the, to the, the tsunami that was coming our way. Um, but you know, quickly it got here. Um, we it kind of hit us in the middle of a four week or a four lecture sampler series that we've been doing for some forty years. So we were able to get the first lecture underway, and then everything stopped. So um, you know that the income stream that we would have gotten from festivals and um, lecture series and other events that we put on, we put on a big appraisal day in the um, in February. All that was gone. So uh, you know, Landmarks was critical in, in um, the grant and helping us uh, basically pay bills. Um, you know, you, you got to keep the heat on in these places. You got to keep the lights on. Um, and and that without that other income stream um, coming in, you know, we've got other we got other grants. We had a PPP which helped. Um, but it was great to have sort of that no strings attached, you know, here's some support. We're going to give it to you now. We know you need it. Um, you don't have to leap through a bunch of hoops. You don't have to create a new program. Um, it's, it's just, you know, here's the support you need. So I think, I think the, um, the museum and arts community was, um, was very cohesive. They pulled together. Everybody was watching everybody's back. We were all in this together, to use the phrase. Um, so I don't know if that's, does that answer your question, Lisa? Yes, thank you, Kurt. Yes, thank you for that great summary. And Betty? Yes. You're with us by phone. Uh, could you yes. also just give us a quick summary of the Lorraine Theater and your community and, and the impact of the, of the pandemic and, and the grant and it, how it helped your organization? Okay. Our um, Lorraine Theater was built in 1921 and opened in 1922 and um, housed vaudeville, silent movies, regular movies, live events. It, it was very well taken care of up until about 
uh, 10 years ago. And then it was the person who owned it left town and left the building um, boarded up and did not pay the mortgage. And anyway, um, a small group of volunteers from Hoopston banded together to save the Lorraine from further damage created when the owner closed the building. And um, a former Hoopston resident actually purchased the building from the bank and deeded it to the Save the Lorraine Foundation. Our whole object is to return the Lorraine to her former beauty. And we've had fundraisers and we've written grants and we were finally able to open the Lorraine again to live events only because we could not afford to have the projection projector replaced and that's like $125,000 to go digital and we couldn't do that. So we were having live events pretty well attended from our small community and surrounding communities and we were making enough money to pay the utilities and pay another group to come in and pay our insurance and then As everyone else has said, the pandemic hit and we closed down in March of 2020, closed the doors. We had no money coming in, so we had to be innovative. First, we started writing grants and thank you very much for letting us be a recipient of a grant from your institution that helped us more than you will ever know. Uh, We used that grant to pay our health uh, health insurance, (laughs) pay our insurance premium on the building for five months. And that kept us going until we could figure out a way to raise money ourselves. And we were innovative. We had weekly popcorn runs where people could go online through the Lorraine Theater and actually purchase popcorn and candy and then drive up and pick it up and take it home and have that for their own movie night. Um, We live in a very depressed economic area. Um, Right now, our rate of free and reduced lunches at the school is 82%. That keeps us from not being able to ask our own citizens for money to help us. So therefore, we had to come up with ways to be innovative and make the money ourselves. Um, We have reopened. We opened in May of 2021. And we've had two groups come in since then. And we are booked for the rest of the year. And not booked every week, but we have four events, five events coming up. And that will be our way to make money to keep going. Thank you, Betty. And um, and if all of you would um, turn off your mute, I just want to have sort of a free flow conversation that any anyone can. Um, what what I find interesting about all four is, I mean, I think. I think that it was Martin who said his organ that has been almost social worker for through the pandemic. And, and so our funding assistance, while united, it was up to businesses. And, and and so it's cedar is functioning to be a find free and buying popcorn or having a place to come and 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 escape uh i i know phil's work pastor phil's work is so critical again in food assistance 
Um, we would have never thought a landmark solenoid assistance, but it was so critical for this place to be able to continue. Oh, you're. So if any of you just want to pick up on that theme that all of you are more than just protectors of wonderful such a Pastor Phil, do you want to speak to that? Um, Lisa, you broke up a little bit on some things. Uh, I was trying to turn my camera off to maybe get a better signal. I'm but... sorry. Yeah, so tell us about just again this pivotal role that you have as being a place for the community. And here, your, our grant helped you with food assistance to the community. Yeah. Yeah. But the place itself has such a critical role in terms of not only food assistance, but arts yeah. programs. Yeah, so um, you know, our, our work um, is, uh, you know, the, the, is interwoven as we are a hyper local arts organization in North London. And so that means that <clears throat> there are residents who uh, are looking for, for their own kids and for themselves even, safe places to gather, safe places to feel valued, safe places to engage. And so the current programming that we do is a bunch of young people in engaged this summer in our prevention stuff, but there are things like a repast that will take place tomorrow evening from a, a long-term community resident who everybody knows and loves and he passed away from liver cancer. So it becomes one of those kind of hubs where this is the place that cares enough for us that they'll prepare food for um, uh, our families, our young people. They'll they'll uh, host block club events uh, in support of us. I mean, the CPD has come to us and said, hey, if you hold a block club and can't get a permit, we'll block the streets off for you because we know you guys are hosting it. I mean, I, I honor that and appreciate the respect that that's given um, in those organizations and, and among CPD and others. Uh, and, and don't take it lightly. So it's, it's beyond our, 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 our current focus, right? Intervention and prevention. And so we see the space like, like restoring old buildings, right? It's restoring the neighborhood at the same time, right? And so creating whatever areas that have been left unhealed uh, to create healing spaces, both in our building and outside of our building and through our great staff. And so there's a lot of, of uh, things that Hey, Phil, can, can we host a bingo game on a Sunday night with seniors who don't have a place to go? I mean, that's crazy, right? But I feel uh, humbled that we can offer that and come through and, um, and engage in it. And, you know, from that, people protect our building and watch our building and make sure nothing happens because of the love that we're seeking to kind of exert. I love that, Pastor Phil, healing spaces. Um, Betty, I would think the Lorraine Theater in your community is a healing space. Can you speak to that? Yes, I can. Um, there, there is a lot of buildings that are crumbling and falling apart in Hoopston and not a whole lot for families to do together. And since we have opened, um, we try to make available the theater for other things besides just a concert or a play we host a, a magic show and, and invite families to come at no cost. We offer popcorn and a, and a fountain drink so they can come in and be together and do something fun as a family. We also have um, hosted um, talent shows and with local people coming in and singing or, or doing an impromptu or playing a musical instrument and inviting the community to come in and see that on uh, a, based on a, a donation if they want to, but they don't have to put any money in, they can come in and watch maybe their own kids perform on stage. It's been a real uplifting thing for a lot of people. Hello. 
Okay, I think maybe here I am. Sorry about that. I was having a hard time <laughs> unmuting as well. Um, Kurt, can you give us a little bit of understanding of of uh, your entire campus of buildings and how it's a healing place for your community and maybe especially during this time. There we go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think, you know, during the pandemic, right, everybody was, you know, cooped up at the house and they're going through all those things that they had, you know, accumulated from uh, Aunt Betty and Uncle Lou. And um, they're, they're um, thinking about history. They're going through their own items. I, I mean, I think the, the interest in history is always there. Um, and we've kind of always been, you know, prided ourselves in kind of being the focal point for that. Um, whether it whether it has to do with preservation or we have a research library here, so we had a lot of um, actually remote research requests. So people couldn't come in, but we have uh, volunteer researchers who do work for for them and can and research you know family histories or whatever they're looking for. Actually, a lot of it has to do with properties. Everybody wants to know what was it you know what was their farm used for before. It, before they got there, um, and then I think I think just just the space of um, you know being on the campus, uh, we have a pioneer garden that's here, um, so it's in a, little, in a way it's a little bit of an oasis for people um, to just kind of connect with their roots. Um, you know, conservation district, same sort of thing, right? A lot of people went out, hiked, biked, um, got outside. Does that answer your question? Sorry about that. It seems that we're all having an unmute delay here. So I apologize to everyone for that. Um, yes, thank you, Kurt. And, you know, again, I just, and the reason I took my camera off, I'm sorry, everyone, is because I heard that there was some problems hearing me. So I was hoping that would help. Martin, I want to give the, the platform back to you and um, just give us a sense in Uptown. I mean, it, Uptown is such a vital commercial district and a vital entertainment district. And of course, you know, during a pandemic, there's no entertainment taking place. Uh, the Green Mill is one of those anchor businesses. Uh, help us understand how you have been you know, advising and coaching businesses, whether they're uh, entertainment venues or whether they're food venues that relied on entertainment uh, to help them pivot and, and go to more of a, an online type of situation. Or you said you also started a, a sidewalk dining program. Um, for those who have not been uptown, it's such a wonderful historic district, and we can only imagine the impact that the pandemic had on it. Yeah, that's a great question. I think for some of our larger entertainment venues, for those of you who are like the Riviera Theater or the Aragon, you know, their you know their bread and butter is big concerts, which there was. You know, not a lot we could do for them, but we did work with some of our smaller venues, like Lisa said, to really focus on, hey, what could they do to shift outside? So that's what we were getting. Um, they had a rehearsal going on in a, in a vacant space they have, and they happened to have the windows open. So uh, neighbors enjoyed that. And then um, the other us, uh, uh, entertainment business we worked a lot with was the Baton Show Lounge, which is a 50 year old drag club, which recently moved to Uptown. And we worked with them to get um, an outdoor space where they could have a stage and do certain performances um, last summer. So they were really excited to get that started up. They got food service. Um, so really to activate the sidewalk. The other thing kind of building off what other folks said was, you know, we host a lot of events in the neighborhood. <laughs> to bring people to Uptown. We also, you know, a lot of local businesses activate 
during the summer and, and block clubs. So one thing we did last year was we pivoted. We had to stop all of our big street festivals. So instead of that, we did um, uh, an art weekend where we had some muralists out to paint murals in the neighborhood. We put together a list of more than 100 pieces of public art and you know, shared that at a, as a Google map so folks could just walk around. And we had a ton of people come out um, for that weekend to look at art, to see murals going up. Um, and the biggest, you know, the most positive review that came from one of the attendees was, I had so much fun at your event, it felt almost normal. Um, so that was a big, you know, we patted ourselves on the back if we could make somebody feel like they had a normal weekend last summer. Um, and the other thing we did is, you know, working with businesses who are investing in there. Um, as we're coming out of the pandemic, we've actually seen a lot of business owners and property owners wanting to invest in their building. So working with them to take advantage of programs that the city has, um, actually talking a lot about landmark incentives with some property owners, because folks are now seeing the other end of things and really looking to invest, which is great. Um, real quick, I do want to give a shout out to Smitha Vassen, who is uh, with Smith Group. She was actually one of the lead architects on our new office space. So I um, want to thank their team at Smith Group for doing a great job designing our new office. Thank you so much for that, Martin. And uh, right now, um, I'd like to see if we have any other questions coming in. I know that Jean Follett noted, we're not out of this pandemic. So uh, does anyone want to help us understand, you know, next steps for your organization? And, um, you know, we don't want to uh, think that we could go through this again, uh, but there's nothing to say in the fall that we couldn't have another surge of some type and, and help us understand how you're preparing yourselves moving forward. If anyone wants to take that first, it's, it's whoever would like. Do, uh, Kurt, would you like to take it? Um, sure. Um, so I think for a long period of time, we were all dealing with that sort of uncertainty about you know finding our footing and 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 trying to at least know because we're all trying to plan right and we're all trying to figure out um we've been used to planning schedules a year ahead of time and now we're kind of going almost week by week in some cases as far as what we can do um you're getting mixed messages you know from different health organizations i mean it's it's <laughs> You call up, you know, we we would call up the county health department, and 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 they were like, um, I don't know, what do you think, um, type of thing, and um, you know, because everybody's sort of looking at everybody else. So hopefully that is behind us now, um, you know. But at the back of our minds, I, I think we're still thinking, wow, you know, um, there's this Delta variant. Is it going to take hold come fall? Um, so in a sense, I think. Um, a lot of what we do might never really return exactly like it did before, um, but you can kind of flip that on its head and, and make it a positive because, you know, God, I remember, um, you know, we would cancel board meetings when the snow was too deep um, because <laughs> we were afraid people, people, people couldn't make it here, right? And um, and now it's it's just uh, Zoom. Um, you know, we do a lot of our committee meetings by Zoom. Um, there's programs like this or by Zoom. Um, so, I mean, I think aspects of what we learned from the pandemic are going to stay with us for a long time. I agree. I agree. Um, you know, I actually had one question in the chat room where someone wanted to know if um, any of your any of your buildings are green. Uh, wondering if any of your renovations have taken into account. Um, any cost savings, energy savings, uh, and, and, and especially now when you think about the fact that, Kurt, as you said, our, our grant money helped pay for some of your utility bills. Um, did the pandemic make you rethink your energy costs and, and just sort of your operational costs of your buildings and, and how you needed to uh, think them through for the going forward in the, 
you know, from a cost savings perspective? Sure. So, um, see, I got here a little under nine years ago. Um, and so we were, you know, like many organizations, I think, um, in a situation where something breaks, right, you fix. It. And the whole idea, I think, is to develop a, a capital replacement plan. So we tried to more, we tried to formalize um, the maintenance project uh, process, you know, you get service agreements um, to, so you, so you have somebody coming, a professional that will inspect your, you know, rooftop units or whatever on a regular basis. Um, and so you can stay ahead of these things. As I, I responded in the chat, I mean, one of the things that we did, you may recall a number of years ago, you, I'm thinking like maybe 2014, you know, time flies. Um, ComEd had come out with a program um, that would allow, would pay for a large percentage of the cost of converting your lights over to LEDs. So um, as I mentioned before, we're in an old gym. It operated until the 60s and or uh, a school, I mean, but the, the school back in the 50s, they added a gym and it had those old mercury vapor lights that you guys probably remember, you know, you turn them on and you hear like, Wah! and the, um, it would be a long time before the lights even went on. And so, you know, we could, we could sit there and just watch the meter spin like this. And um, so we converted all of those lights to LED strips. Um, and and cut our energy costs uh, significantly by doing that. Um, it's an ongoing process, certainly. Um, you know that you can use for um, energy. We you know install energy efficient furnaces. Um, you know our insulation is not the best. I can tell you because I'm in this corner office, and in the winter time it gets nippy in here. Um, but um, you know it's a process, so I think that's important for sure. And, and, and how about you, Betty? Is this something that you all are trying to think about at the Lorraine in terms of energy cost savings and, and how that may be beneficial to you? Sounds like you need to look into well, a ComEd program. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we, um, we were lucky that when this building was constructed, it was uh, pretty far advanced for a 1921 22 building, they actually put a, a swamp cooler in the basement, and that would either cool the building, or then you would turn on, reverse it, and, and add your heat, and it would make the heat go all over the building, and uh, kept the cost of heating and cooling that building very low. It seats 317 people now. Back when it was built, it seated 800 and some because the seats were so much smaller and very, very close together. But we could, they could put 800 people in that building. So it's a large building and we have kept our cost of that down to a minimum by using and being able to keep running the swamp cooler, we have added um, dehumidifiers throughout the building to help combat the moisture at, that will, of course, get into the building and cause all kinds of havoc. So, yes, we have really tried to follow the green guidelines and not go over overboard in trying to change what was already there that worked. Right, right. And um, I, I, I learned that Pastor Phil uh, left us, I believe. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry because we had one shout out for him from Blatch Killingsworth for their incredible work in the Lawndale community. So we'll make sure to relay that to him. Um, one thing we want to do before we sign off here, um, Suzanne, if you could go to the to the final slide. I'm still here. I, I saw. Oh, that there from, you are. Oh, wonderful. I, Thank I you. Saw, I, I saw that from Blanche. Yeah. Yeah. Great. <laughs> okay. Wonderful. <laughs> um, I was going to say, Suzanne, if you could go to the last slide. 
Um, but what we do want to give you the chance, uh, Pastor Phil, um, again, we want to give a pitch to all of you, uh, websites for all of your organizations, because the work all of you do is so important. And we want to give everyone the opportunity to go to your websites and learn more about the work that you do and um, hopefully give a donation and hopefully visit too. So Pastor Phil, if people want to get involved, if they want to know more about where people can volunteer, should they reach out to you and help us understand uh, what your needs are? Well, we have several things coming up um, this, finishing up this month with our project presence and finishing up in August uh, where we have residents who are committing to a particular area of the neighborhood to bring what we call righteous agitation. So folks, hey, I, I have some time on a Wednesday night from six to nine or a Friday from three to six or a Saturday or a Sunday. Uh, they can go on our website. I believe there's a, a link on there where they can, you know, uh, uh, you know, just say, hey, I'm interested in, in volunteering. Could you reach out to me? We have uh, uh, some partnerships with different block clubs happening in, the f in, in August. And we have our own uh, Firefest hip hop block party happening August 14th. And uh, we, we're, we're uh, on Fridays, second and fourth Friday, we're giving out what we call a, a smoke out. So from 11 to one o'clock, we give out burgers and, and, and hot dogs. We also give away 200 meals for families to come up and to, to pick up and, and walk away. So there's Plenty of room and plenty of space for folks to volunteer. And having talked about the times to work with our kids within the various art classes, but just hit that link. And there's a spot on there where people can say, hey, I want to support, give me a call and, and, and we can set up something from there. Oh, that's wonderful. And for those of you um, who may not be aware, uh, we were, Pastor Phil and I were talking about this earlier, their beautiful historic firehouse is actually across the street from the former castle car wash of Route 66 fame which Landmarks Illinois had on its uh, Chicagoland watch list some years ago. So it's a wonderful uh, neighborhood of incredible buildings. Um, and so, uh, Kurt, can you tell us at the McHenry County Historical Society some upcoming events you may be having that people this summer would like to venture out to Union and, and experience? Sure, sure. So as fate would have it, um, Sunday is our 34th annual Heritage Fair. So we had to skip all that last year because of the pandemic, um, but it's back this year. It has a classic car show. And the cool thing about being located in a little town is you can park all the classic cars down the main drag. So <laughs> they are on either side of the road going down. Um, and there is a, uh, there's a, a, a couple taverns and restaurants down here too that are, are older. <laughs> The, the theory is that Union never went dry during Prohibition, so um, it's it's a popular spot. Um, and so we, yeah, we have a, a pie baking contest. Um, we we have a uh, Illinois Humanities actually. Dennis Stolmat, which is a uh, he's a Cajun fiddler, he's going to be performing. Um, we have a, a a huge plant sale, so it's it's really fun. A lot of folks come out here. Um, it's a nice trip, you know, it's close to the tollway in 20, so you can make it out here for that. Um, right, for a, for a nice day trip during the summer. For a nice day trip, yeah. And for those so, that don't know, the Illinois Railway Museum is close by as well, which is a Yeah, we're, they have their Thomas the Tank engine thing. So if, if, you, if you like <laughs> to see lots of minivans and strollers, that's the place to go. <laughs> Thank you, Kurt. And I want to give a shout out to Kurt because he's one of the great historic preservation advocates of McHenry County. And we've worked on many efforts together throughout the county. Um, Lorraine, tell us about some, of, I think you have an upcoming summer event, don't you? Uh, Betty? Oh, Betty, oh. I'm sorry about the Lorraine, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's I'm okay. The Lorraine Foundation. No. <laughs> right. And I well, want to know why just... the theater is named Lorraine in the first place. But anyway, yes, Betty, I don't tell know. Us. <laughs> um, last uh, week was our 100 Pupston's 150th um, birthday, and they incorporated Lorraine events in with that. And we had several people come and walk through the building and we had a magic show for the kids and tried just to keep the building 
in focus as a big part of Hoopston. And then we have some live events coming up. Uh, July 24th, we have a rock and roll review. And then in September, we have a musical and it features local talent. And that, those always do very well. And then in December, we have the Blue Suede crew coming in to do um, a Christmas special. And in between all of that, we are trying to replace the roof on the building. And we have to do that because of all the torrential rains we've had have decided to inside the building was a good place to be. So we're working on that and fundraising for that. So we do have a lot coming up and we have a very small group. Our volunteer group started at about 24 people and we are down to eight. And those eight people work very, very hard to keep the Lorraine uh, as a focal point in Hoopston. That's wonderful, Betty. Thank you so much. And um, lastly, Martin, is there anything you want to tell us about that's happening in Uptown this summer? Sure, we're finally getting our in-person events back online. So our um, first big one is August the 6th through 15th, which is the Uptown Art Week. We've extended to a full week. I think we'll have probably up to about 40 different artists painting murals all around Uptown on walls big and small. Um, plus, uh, Uptown already has hundreds of great pieces of public art. Businesses will be doing art openings and art events and have galleries and we may um, have a couple other special programs. So highly recommend coming to Uptown um, on a nice day that week and just walking around um, our beautiful neighborhood. Wonderful, thank you. Well, I think we're at the end of the hour. We're, we're gonna give two minutes back to everyone. And uh, we really appreciate you tuning in on a summer day. Um, and again, please jot down the websites of our four organizations who participated in this uh, presentation today. We're sorry for all the technical difficulties um, between uh, some of our muting issues and some of our connection issues, but thank you for, for sticking it out with us. And uh, we hope that you'll consider visiting all of our uh, organizations that we highlighted today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.